Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the slightly mad house. <laughs> Whether you're here often or visiting today, welcome to worship and welcome to Dorna Cathedral. We hope you find a blessing here and maybe even a calling. As you'll have noticed, Roddy, our organist is not here. He's fine. He's just having a well-deserved rest this morning. But we're indebted as ever to our choir. Um, and especially this morning to Donald, um, who's lending us his, his many talents. Um, so thank you to everyone for um, leading us in music today and in song. Notices to um, remind you of. Um, there are services this afternoon in Oversteps Care Home and the Meadows Nursing Home. So 2.30 at Oversteps and 3.15 at the Meadows. All are welcome to come along and to help um, lead worship and enjoy the company of the residents there. And then this evening, there's another Songs at Seven. It's a short time of singing um, favourite hymns and stories about those hymns. And tonight it's led by the women's group. Now, is there also, is that today the Croic one as well? Yeah, the 16th. I was thinking it might be next week, but it's this week. So the yeah, a service also today, so you have lots of choices today. Um, there's a service also at Croic at 3pm, and it says there the garden at Amat is also open if you want to call in there too. And um, Faye and Alison, give us a wave, there they are. Um, their gardens are also open today. It was kind of a... Oh, is it next week? Next week, ah, you see, that might be the confusion in my head then. So next Saturday and Sunday, because I was thinking of you yesterday and all the rain. <laughs> Good, so that's next week, that's great. Saturday and Sunday, and the details, the addresses are in there and will be available later. 
Um, and Willie is looking for articles and photos for the August-September issue of the Parish News to be in his hands or on his laptop by the end of the day tomorrow. And I know the sooner you can send them to him, the happier man he will be. Um, and I think that's it, except to say there are teas and coffees here in the crossing after the service. And if you're able to stay, um, you'd be very, very welcome. Love, perfect and whole. Love, tentative but true. Love calls us here. Come meet God's love with yours. Let us pray. Love giving God, we are here to give you all we are in this heart on sleeve moment. No need now to hold back. No need now for pretense. No need now to think your gaze is anywhere but where we are. Love giving, life living Lord. Be to us as each has need we pray. Speak to us all as all must hear. Lord, remind us who we are and all we can together be for your glory. Amen. And the first of the hymns for us to join in together is number 172, Sing for God's Glory, hymn 172.
on worshipping together in our prayers and we say together the Lord's Prayer, which you can find in the back of the service sheet. Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, for these summer days and we pray we do not miss the hints of heaven you plant along our way. The swallows darting dance, reminding us the journey shall not get the better of us. Dandelions and toad flax and forget-me-nots, a holy riot of wild flowers, reminding us that life, however fleeting, is meant for living. Even the weather, rain one minute, sunshine the next, reminding us, especially when we feel pressed, that there is always reason to hope. Lord, we pray we here be like children, not missing a thing, especially in this hour as our hearts unfurl and open to you. May we hear our stories in the ancient tales which draw us. May we feel our faith deepening, our love being strengthened as together we find a way to be. Lord, forgive us if sometimes we curse the day rather than embrace it. Forgive us if sometimes we curse even you, our God, our never-ending blessing. Forgive us if sometimes we shun the story of your people rather than find our place in it. Forgive us, Lord, and free us to live for you, the God who never leaves nor turns from us. Come to me, your word to each one of us. Come to me and know the forgiveness that is yours already. Come to me and trust the love that is yours to give home to. We thank you, Lord. And we join our voices to pray together words Jesus taught his friends, including us, to live, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, has anyone been watching Wimbledon over the last few days? Yes. <laughs> or are you like me, just in it for the strawberries? <laughs> it's dramatic stuff, isn't it? The women's game yesterday was particularly dramatic. To win a tournament is an incredible achievement, but to win one when no one expects you to get near the final is just astonishing. And so, I have some tennis jokes for you, <laughs> which you might want to return because they're rubbish. Ah, uh, that one was for free. <laughs> okay, the first one's really bad, okay. Um, where did the two tennis players go on their first date? To the ball, to the ball, no, to the ball, yeah, to the ball. I told you it's very bad. What do you call the girl who keeps standing in the middle of the tennis court? Annette, there you go. <laughs> Why did the tennis player find it hard to catch the waiter's eye? Because he kept returning everything. I know. Um, why do fish make shockingly bad tennis players? 
can hear the wheels going round because they don't like to get near the net. Like that's the only reason they would make bad tennis players. <laughs> I did, you know, I went down one of those Facebook rabbit holes yesterday where you watch video after video and I did actually see goldfish playing football. I mean, they were in water, don't be worried about them, but there was a pitch at the bottom and they were actually guiding the ball into the net. <laughs> Just wondered how long the person sat there filming it to wait for them to actually do that. In the tennis tournament, why was the strawberry predicted to perform better than the banana? There you go, because it was seeded. <laughs> except, except that falls down, <laughs> because yesterday's champion was not seeded. Why should you, this is the last one, just to reassure you this ends, okay? <laughs> Why should you never date a tennis player? I hear whispers. Because love means nothing to them. <laughs> there is where we were going. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it, that the thing that means most in the world, love, means least in tennis. 15 love, 30 love, a way of saying zero. Have you wondered why they say love, or is it just me? Yeah, I don't know if it's right, but I read about, um, well, a zero is a bit like an egg, and the French word is luf. I don't know, maybe it's true, maybe that's the worst that you'll hear here today, I don't know. But love isn't nothing. Love is everything. And love, to quote the gospel according to the Beatles, is all you need. <laughs> it's why God crept down to earth. It's why God lived and grew and told stories and refused to meet violence with violence. Because God is love and love is everything and love is all we need. And those who feel they're nothing or who others say are not worth much discover they are everything we are everything to God, who is love. I'm going to sing a song which leads to a verse about the Spirit, the bright wind of heaven, kindling love. It's number 607, and we're singing it to a different tune than the one that you might have in front of you. We're singing it to the Bard of Armagh, which I think is 527 or something like that, if you want to follow it. 522, is it 522? Can't remember, we'll find it. Yeah, five two two is a tune and six or seven for the words.
Our first, first reading this morning is from the Old Testament section of the Pew Bible. It's Genesis 25, verses 21 to 28, and you can find this on page 26. Because Rebekah had no children, Isaac prayed to the Lord for her. The Lord answered his prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant. She was going to have twins, and before they were born, they struggled against each other in her womb. She said, why should something like this happen to me? So she went to ask the Lord for an answer. The Lord said to her, two nations are within you. You will give birth to two rival peoples. One will be stronger than the other. The older will serve the younger. The time came for her to give birth, and she had twin sons. The first one was reddish, and his skin was like a hairy robe, so he was named Esau. The second one was born, holding on tightly to the heel of Esau, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. Esau sells his rights as the firstborn son. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skilled hunter, a man who loved the outdoors. But Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac preferred Esau because he enjoyed eating the animals Esau killed. But Rebekah preferred Jacob. Our New Testament reading is from Romans verse six, sorry, chapter 16, verses 1 to 7 and 12 to 16. And you can find this at page 204 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bible. Personal greetings. I recommend you to you our sister Phoebe, who serves the church in Centria. Receive her in the Lord's name, as God's people should, and give her any help she may need from you. For she herself has been a good friend to many people and also to me. I send greetings to Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in the service of Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. I am grateful to them. Not only I, but all the Gentile churches as well. Greetings also to the church that meets in their house. Greetings to my dear friend Eponetus, who was the first in the province of Asia to believe in Christ. Greetings to Maria, who has worked so hard for you. Greetings also to Andronicus and Junia, fellow Jews who were in prison with me. They are well known among the apostles, and they became Christians before I did. My greetings to Tryphena and Tryphosa, who work in the Lord's service, and to my dear friend Persis, who has done so much work for the Lord. I send greetings to Rufus, that outstanding worker in the Lord's service, and to his mother, who has always treated me like a son. My greetings to Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and all other Christians with them. Greetings to Philologus and Julia, to Nereus and his sister, to Olympus, and to all of God's people who are with them. Greet one another with a kiss of peace. All the churches of Christ send you their greetings. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, John. So these are the readings given us today to ponder. We're going to, as we approach the reflection, kind of sit back from them and approach them in a, in a broad way rather than drill down into any one of them. 
But for now, we're going to pray together um, and think of those who are looking for comfort and reassurance today. And if, those, if we are those people, then we bring ourselves in prayer. Let us pray. <coughs> Loving God, we seek your comfort, your reassurance, perhaps for ourselves, but mostly for those we know well whose lives are far from easy for now. And of course, for those whom we will never know, but whose stories concern us still. Lord, as we think of Paul and his greetings to his church family, we think of our church family, especially those ill or out of sorts at home or in hospital. And so we pray for Lydia and for Mary and those others we name now in our hearts. Lord, may each and all know and feel your love hold them, your peace enfold them, even as we pray. Lord, we pray for those now living in care homes, unable to worship here in person, but who remain an important part of this family. And so we pray for Charlie and Margaret and Gwen, Rena and Isabel, Crystal and Mary and Alison, and those others we know. We think too of their families, especially where the move has been recent. Lord, may each and all know and feel your love hold them, your peace enfold them, even as we pray. Lord, we think of those present here beside us, some whose names and stories we know, others we are learning still. And of course, we pray for all visiting today, asking that the experience will stay with them far beyond these moments. Lord, may each and all know and feel your love hold them, your peace enfold them, even as we pray. And Lord, we pray for any today dealing with secret pain, perhaps like Rebecca, with something difficult or unwanted, perhaps like Isaac, with a sudden longing or years of wondering, when me? We pray too for those like Paul, so grateful for everyone who walks with him, who works with him, who helps him, who bears his load. May each and all know and feel your love for them. May your peace enfold them, even as we pray. Lord, we think wider to the world, to places where there is too much rain, too much heat, to people living with uncertainty and violence. Lord, may each and all know and feel your love hold them, your peace enfold them, even as we pray for the kingdom's sake. Amen. We sing again, number 566. I don't know, do we know this one? 566? Yes, yeah, it's known to us. So when I receive the peace of Christ, number 566.
the bright wind of heaven And where it is going to no one can see But where it is passing our hearts are awakening To stretch from the darkness and reach for the day These words, some spoken read have become a mantra for me in these days. We sung them earlier, number 607. You might want to look at them again and sing them with me as I go. There is to me such truth in them. I want to keep on singing them. I want to live with them. I want to live into the truth of them and help others do the same, which is a thought I'll try to explain. You know, they say in terms of history that we are going through not so much an age of change as a change of age. And where it's going to land is not yet certain. In the grand scheme of things, we're moving from the Holocene to the Anthropocene age. The Anthropocene age is the one we're moving to or are in already, perhaps, where the work of the human hand is now most visibly seen in Earth and not for good. Think, for example, of microplastics fossilized in rock or swimming our oceans. Speaking socially, though, there is talk of metamodernism. Modernism, we know. We've lived through it, some of us. Postmodernism, certainly. As one writer has summarized crudely, she's aware, We've gone from modernism, make it new, let's shape history, to postmodernism, also and not without coincidence, post World War II. Everything stinks, nothing really matters. And now there is possibly metamodernism, which says maybe things are not so black and white, maybe there's a middle ground to be found. Meta comes from the ancient Greek word metaxis. It was used to capture a sense of in-betweenness. Metamodernism asks, is there a space between what has been before? Is there a way to transcend, but also to include them? It seems to say there may be crisis, but there is also solution. There may be doubts, but there must also be hope. It's saying, to not quite quote the hymn writer, there can be darkness only if there is a dawning day. Sing with me if you will. The bright wind is blowing, the bright wind of heaven, and where it is going to, no one can say. But where it is passing, our hearts are awakening to stretch from the darkness and reach for the day. We're living not so much in an age of change as a change of age, and where it is going to land is yet to be determined. And I wonder if it isn't the same with the church. Church, despite occasional bursts of sunshine, feels in our present circumstance a bit like being under a cloud. I'm speaking here about the Church of Scotland, which is the one I know best, but visitors from other denominations, other countries, tell me about the churches they've come from and of how things are coming undone there too and how everything feels confused and uncertain and exhausting. Here in this denomination, presbytery planning teams have been given an impossible remit, not over yet, to dispose of buildings, as the church puts it, a legalistic and ugly word if ever there was one, to reduce ministries to something as proportionate as teeth to a hen, to unite congregations which in our beautiful but sparsely populated corner of the world sit miles from each other, Some to our shame which don't really care for the others. Some which have been left to let old wounds fester instead of being helped to heal. But we too are experiencing something like that change of age. 
And we sat in our pews, bemoaning the fact that society is moving away from us. But perhaps it's time. Perhaps it was time long ago to acknowledge the fact that there can be no moving away if there is not also a movement too. Which is to say, we can't only do this anymore. We can't simply sit it out, hoping for some great exodus in reverse. These days require us to hold these things together, the decline and the possibility of growth, the moving away and our running toward. We have got to throw open the doors and be found on the other side of them. This is what this day demands. The bright wind is blowing, the bright wind of heaven, and where it is going to no one can say, but where it is passing our hearts are awakening to stretch from the darkness and reach for the day. What has any of this to do with today's text, you might wonder. Well, the Genesis reading in the first instance invites what we called last time a long view. People come and people go. But not only do people come and go, ages come and ages go. And we find our place among, not apart from the story of what has been. We, you and I, are part of a long line of people through the ages who, like Rebecca and Isaac, have waited for God and questioned God and listened for God and sought God's unerring compassion. And we will not be the last. We will not be the last. And there is comfort in that. The passage from Romans, Paul is basically writing a thank you letter a list of greetings and note the diversity for the time in which it was written, the diversity largely ignored through the ages by the church, as at least half of those to whom Paul wanted to express his thanks for their leadership and their service were women. Phoebe, who was likely entrusted to, to deliver his letter to the churches in Rome, Prisca, we've met before, Priscilla, is her Sabbath name. Her role in leadership likely greater in some ways than her husband because his name always follows hers. Junia, about whom we know only her name, but she's described as an apostle, which means she met the risen Christ. What story could she have told? Or what fate befell her that we know no more than this? And then there's Mary, and Jafina and Trefosa, hard workers, we're told, and Persia and Julia, the mother of Rufus, the sister of Nereus. Leadership at the church's beginnings was far more expansive than the church sometimes remembers. And perhaps it can be so again, because everyone here, every single one, has a story to tell of who God is for them. Everyone here has a song to sing of brokenness and blessing. Everyone here, everyone has a gift God given which helps bring the kingdom near. And the Spirit the bright wind of heaven is in this in-between time, urging us to listen to each other, to listen deeply to each other, to listen also to her, to turn and follow where she goes, for where there is darkness, there is also light. And so we sing. The bright wind is blowing, the bright wind of heaven. And where it is going to, no one can say.
But where it is passing, our hearts are awakening to stretch from the darkness and reach for the day. Amen. And just as we approach our prayers of commitment and change, I share a short reflection by John Rodell, which I think captures the essence of that deep, deep listening. I believe we are being called by the Spirit to engage in in these days. He writes, Someday we will all be sitting around the campfire together, taking turns sharing the epic story of our lives. If I understand you, we say to the storyteller when they are finished, after everyone has a chance to speak, and we turn to our neighbour and run our thumbs across the scars we each brought in and they smudge right off of us as if they were lent in ashes and the fire rises and the music between us grows and we start to dance and we are no longer strangers we are a cracking campfire community of seekers and healers, where the act of listening to our neighbours share their story is a sacrament. We're saying, I understand you, is the most powerful prayer we can ever utter. And we keep saying it over and over and over to each other until the dawn comes. And the fire turns into smoke, and we turn into morning birds who travel the world together. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you for your presence always through this age of change in the world and in society and in the church. Thank you for your spirit, the bright wind of heaven calling us, leading the way. Lord, as we give our offering, we give ourselves. And we ask that you help us to feel your spirit as wind on our skin and to follow wherever she shows until the dawn comes as it surely will and we will see you clearly in each other in jesus name we pray amen it's an invitation once again to stay Um, this is a place where conversation and listening happens so if you're able to stay please do Um, and enjoy company and a cup of coffee or tea. And for now, we sing um, number 543, Longing for Light, number 543. And at the end of the service, after the blessing, instead of playing an amen on the piano, could we just say a hearty amen together? Would that be all right? (laughs) Save me dashing back to the piano. We'll just say a big amen together. So let's sing hymn 543.
Whatever love you have felt here, take it. It is yours to share. Whatever calling you have heard here, take it. It is yours to live. The blessing of God, source, saviour, spirit, is with you for now and for always. Amen. Amen.